This is a story that Pudgy's mama told Pudgy when Pudgy was little before she went away. This is the story of how Pudgy's grandparents escaped their original home in the United Kingdom to bring their daughter to live in these lands. While there are no naughty words, some parts of this story may be too difficult for little ones. Pudgy suggests parents listen to story first and make decision accordingly whether they can watch this video. Chapter 1 Luftwaffe When the Great War ended on November 11, 1918, the world breathed a sigh of relief. The German aggressors had been defeated after a period of horrendous war. The human world could pick up the pieces, repair the damage to their homes, and get back to a normal pace of life once more. In the months that passed, the anger of the victors, combined with long-standing feuds, resulted in efforts to punish their defeated foes. This led in turn to a deep sense of resentment by the defeated Germanic peoples. Over time, the resentment turned into hatred. Meanwhile, as the na nation of Great Britain buried its dead, efforts to rebuild their country were in progress. However, rumors began to trickle out from the war-ravaged lands to the east. The charismatic man appeared and gave grand speeches, first attended by dozens of curious onlookers, then hundreds, then thousands. The man had all the answers. The man had plans within plans and would lead the effort to restore Germany to its ancient glory. The speeches were secreted out from Germany into France and the surrounding countries. Once translated, the words spoken and cheered by enthusiastic attendees horrified the surrounding country's leaders. The great nation of the United Kingdom, weary of war, turned a blind eye to the dangers to the southeast and moved on with our daily lives. However, the speeches continued, and the man with all the answers became the leader of the Reichstag. The parliament was then shortly abolished, and the man seized complete control. Their flags were soon replaced with symbols of their ancient heritage on a background red as the blood that flowed within their arteries. Religion was abolished, and replaced by the worshipping of the man with all the answers. The drum beat of war began once again. To restore their honor, war must once again be waged upon their enemies. Aggression quickly spread throughout the continent. Italy soon began their conquest of Ethiopia, then in turn followed by the Spaniards fighting one another in a bloodied civil war. The world desperately tried to stay neutral. Perchance if they were to ignore these terrible things occurring, the insanity would settle down. The aggressions did not subside, and the news quickly spread as the rebuilt German army crossed the border into Poland. War councils were called, and it became clear that there was no other choice. Great Britain, once more joined by its allies, declared war upon Germany on September 3, 1940. Four uneventful days passed afterwards, until during the early morning of the 7th, sound started to be heard faintly in the distance. 
sound grew in volume. Those who could recognized the low hum of airplane engines. While human wives were making their husbands wake up to get ready for work and making preparations for their homes, they watched in horror out of their windows. German-made twin-engine propeller-driven Dornier Do 17 aircraft were flying in tight formation. So low over the ground, one might think they could reach their paws out and touch the plane's metallic bellies. The bombs started to fall out of the sky like drops of rain during a rainstorm. Terrible whistling sounds could be heard before a horrendous explosion of fire and concussive force destroyed all which surrounded the impact site. Buildings which had stood for hundreds of years were leveled in seconds by wave after wave of aerial bombardment. First, it was just the military targets being destroyed. Airports, naval ports, barracks, etc. However, the man with the answers, the Fuhrer as he called himself, soon ordered civilian targets to be sighted. Terror-filled hours turned to days. Days into weeks. Weeks into months. Of constant destruction. Hope gave way to fear as families sought means to safety. Instead of the birds chirping or children playing, sounds of air raid sirens blaring in the distance was all that the subjects of Great Britain heard. As soon as the siren began to call, the humans began to run for their lives. Women and children screamed as bombs rained from the sky. Surely if one were to head underground, it would be safe from the death raining from the skies above. The humans began to collectively head underground to their basements, the train tunnels, ran beneath their cities, or anywhere that wasn't in the sight of the sky. During the times of terror, radio stations ceased their normal programming to broadcast safety warnings. They stayed on the air for as long as they could, until the powerful German air forces struck down their radio towers. As one station would remain silent, the others attempted to boost their power so that they could continue the updates as best they could, given their circumstances. Between the din of exploding bombs and gunfire, the same words were spoken in London and the surrounding area each day. First the Luftwaffe, the name of the German Air Force, would be sighted. Then the attack runs would start, with London being the primary target. Though the surrounding areas were also being struck. Invariably, once fuel was low and weapons depleted, the terror from the skies eased as the planes return to the area in the fatherland. Timidly, the humans emerge from their places of safety. To view their homes in ruins, and the ground still smoldering from the fire of hatred that cast down upon their land. The radios still worked, 
at least places that had power, than the places within their destroyed structures. The latest raid by the German forces has ceased. I repeat, the latest raid has ceased. The Royal Air Force has chased the forces of the Fuhrer Hitler back across the English Channel. Reports are coming in from all around the city, and the police have been dispatched to assist the areas in most need. Casualties have not yet been reported, but appear to be low at this time. King George... In the background, as the humans dealt with their affairs, a different scene was unfolding to the east of the London city outskirts. Farmland, which had once been full of vegetables, had been obliterated by the weapons of war. Fire crackled, steam hissed as moisture was driven from the plants. Beside the fields lay forests that had grown since the time before the humans' arrival. Mama. Mama. The sound of a timid rabbit hung on the air as the young one searched for a missing parent. The brown rabbit hopped frantically, searching with pleading eyes and ears outstretched for a fleeting response. Mama. Mama. The rabbit cried out and saw a he hedgehog standing on its hind legs peeking over a nearby pile of stone. Mr. Hedgehog, could you help me find my mama? The rabbit cried out as she hopped towards him. I watched as his quills covered, started to twitch, and the animal turned around with a sad expression on his face. The male hedgehog immediately pulled the small rabbit close and hugged her gently, saying, I'm sorry. The stone pile, which had once been a wall, built to hold the hillside back. A German bomb had prematurely released from the aircraft and exploded nearby, causing the wall to fall onto a nearby garden for the humans. The body of an adult rabbit was crushed by a pile of moss-covered stones. Its eyes were rolled back with a carrot still in its mouth. Tears flowed. Wails of sadness filled the air as the female rabbit had found her mother. The brown hedgehog hugged tighter, closing his eyes too as he started to cry, whispering, The humans fight, and we always die first. They never think what happens to the rest of us. The hedgehog said with a curt tone. Tentatively, he took a step and started to maneuver the hysterical young rabbit with him away from the pile of stones. It didn't work. The young rabbit bro broke free of his embrace and hopped quickly to reach her mother. Furiously, she tried to lift the heavy stones off of her mother's body. I, I, I can save her. Please, Mr. Hedgehog, you need to help. The hedgehog turned and walked slowly behind the rabbit and placed a paw on her head between her long ears. The rabbit dropped on all fours and began to wail loudly. The smell of death hung in the air, and the horror of the realization was dawning upon the young animal that her mother had left this world. Tense minutes had passed in silence as the hedgehog spoke. I'm... Truly sorry, Mrs. Rabbit passed on. Please, c c come with me. I'm sure my wife will have made supper. You can spend some time with us until you figure out what you want to do. The rabbit shook her head. Now, I am staying with my mother. 
There is no place safe. The humans will not stop until we're all dead. Sighing. He turned around. All right. If you change your mind, follow the path until you reach a stump. Then make a left to find my burrow. Scampering off, the hedgehog did just that. Followed a human path well worn by the farm workers. The humans were all gone now. No doubt that they were still hiding somewhere as the terrible objects fell from the sky. This meant that the hedgehog could come out and about with less concern than normal. Normally, the humans would chase them off to protect their crops. Down the, the path the critters scampered with little regard. Until he saw the edge of a forest. Though the trees were sparse. Once, a mighty forest stood here. Until the humans cut down all the trees to build their homes and eat them. Now only the stumps of the, and the skinniest of trees st stood. In the winter, it was so bad that the humans even resorted to ripping the stumps out of the ground for firewood. This was problematic, having resulted in the displacement of many animals' homes. Luckily, he had not had to find a new home for two winters, since there was a big rock in the way. Seeing the stump that he had spoken of earlier, made a left, and saw the entrance to his burrow. A female hedgehog was standing on her hind legs, looking worried to the left. Scampering up behind her, he whispered, Guess who? The female giggled as she whittled her nose. Oh, Philip. I was so worried. Where have you been? The male hedgehog watched as the female turned around and rubbed her brown nose against his. Their dark eyes ma matched and their brown quills t twitched occasionally. I'm fine, Margaret. I was up, at, up the path to check on the garden. One of the human weapons destroyed it and killed Mrs. Rabbit. Her daughter is there now. She won't leave the body. I offered her home for her the rest, but she wouldn't take me up on the offer this time. Margaret nodded. Oh my. That poor thing. I'll have a talk with her later. Come inside, I have supper ready. Margaret slid down a slight hill and underneath the oak stump before being followed by her husband. The hedgehog's home was plain but very nice. The ground had been dug out to create a large central area. It was big enough to hold three hedgehogs, and the ground was covered with smooth, flat pieces of flint stone. In the center of the room was a pile of turnips. The two hedgehogs smiled at each other, took positions opposite of one another, and reached for a turnip to munch on. Margaret giggled when Philip made a face. Well, I am sorry. But turnips are the only thing growing at this time of the year. What do you want, one of those human-baked items? The husband nodded and gave her a smile. A biscuit would be nice, but it is rare to find those around here. I did manage to sneak off one, uh, off one from a farmer's hand, uh, farm hand's lunch pail. No, no, no. The, the turnips are fine. Thank you, my lovely wife. I shall go pick flowers later. Oh, Philip. <laughs> the hedgehogs were mated to one another and had been trying to start the family. There were complications, and so far, nothing they had tried to work. While other males might have run off to find a more fertile female option. Philip chose to stay with Margaret because he truly loved her. 
You could see the pain in her eyes, though, as desperately she wanted young hedgehogs running around the burrow. The two continued to eat in relative silence until the pile of vegetables had been depleted. It was not long that Philip exited the underground home and scampered through the tall grass to go searching for a flower. Margaret giggled and waved as she watched her husband disappear behind a thorn bush. The sounds of whimpering started to be heard, and the female hedgehog turned and watched as a br brown rabbit peeked around the edge of a stump. Oh my. You're the young rabbit the Philip spoke of earlier, but please c come here. I have a few turnips left. The rabbit nodded and hopped inside the burrow to follow the female hedgehog. While the rabbit nibbled on an offered vegetable, Margaret hoped her husband was okay. Bill did crossed a distance during this time, powered up on icky turnips. He was tooting so much that they had gained a quite a considerable amount of speed. It was not the root vegetables that tasted bad. It just made him really gassy. So picking flowers was a good excuse to get out and vent literally. Otherwise, there'd be an argument inside the burrow. Across the forest and down the slight hill, the critter scampered until he reached the edge of a stream. Water was shallow, allowing him to cross easily. Ordinarily, he would cross without a second thought. There was something off about the water. Droplets of blood were floating on the surface, and it flowed past him. Wiggling his nose, he could see the purple and blue wildflowers just growing across the bank, but his curiosity was gnawing at the back of his mind, urging him to follow the stream. Hesitating a moment, Philip shook his head, and then turned to the right. Scampering along the bank, he watched as the stream waved to and fro, him deeper in spots. Strangely, there were no frogs or turtles present. And that fact was starting to un unnerve him. Water had a foreign co coloration, and it was starting to become thicker, with an acrid smell filling the air. His instincts were starting to kick in. Perhaps he should run. Flee. Hide. Shaking his head, the little hedgehog still pressed on, climbing over piles of gray rocks and weaving between fallen tree branches while trying to press on. Sounds began to fill the air of crackling noises like fire dancing on the, on the logs within a hearth. Ahead was a small waterfall cascading over a higher part of the stream. More strange smells. Something was burning, but he didn't know, he knew not what. Through the brambles and between the logs, up the banks, and across a series of flat logs that just jutted out of the water, Philip scampered until he could just barely see over the crest of the hill. Rarely did Philip ever venture this far from home, since this is where the humans worked the fields of wheat. Blinking several times, the critter looked on in horror as he saw the entire field was on fire. A giant thing had crashed into the ground, it broke apart in thousands of pieces. Jagged pieces of metal were driven into the ground and sticking out in weird angles. Shards of glass were strewn about the area, while the smell of death hung heavily in the air. Swallowing hard, Philip stamped forward through a tubular piece of green metal. The insides were slippery, and soon the hedgehog was sliding very fast through it. He popped out the other side with his paws covered in something black and gooey. It smelled bad, and when he tasted it, it tasted horrid. 
spitting it out. The curious animal started to move about, about the wreckage. He spoke. I wonder if this is what caused the field stone wall to be knocked over. The hedgehog said out loud. While walking past a large section of the metal, there was a narrow chamber that was connected by a wide wing of metal piece. The two upright pieces connected at each end, and it was painted dark green. Though so there was a red rectangle prominently visible. Inside the red rectangle was a white circle with a strange black symbol in the center. Wiggling his nose and hesitantly reaching out a paw, Philip touched the metal. It was cool to the touch and very smooth. Turning, he continued to walk along the section of the metal until he reached an even larger thing. It looked like a giant cave. So there was light streaming in from above. Maybe something neat is inside. I, I always bring Margaret flowers. Perhaps I can find his biscuits. The hedgehog nodded and pushed his feelings to, uh, to flee far into the back of his mind as he headed inside. As the hedgehog crossed over a jagged piece of metal, he could smell the unmistakable smell of death. The metal sloped upward at a steep pace and he could see two seats where humans were sitting. Their heads were snapped back, and their eyes were dull, staring at him without movement. Philip covered his mouth to cover his sti- uh, and try to stifle a scream as he looked at the humans. They were dripping red, and red was splattered all over the sections of the interior. the sound of something hitting the metal above him, and as the hedgehog looked around, he started to see a small by human standards metal case sliding towards him. There were bars of metal that were running parallel to each other, and more metal connected on top with circular patterns. A screeching sound filled the empty chamber and landed directly in front of his paws. It looked like a can of sardines, and was in the shape of an oval. Ah, what bloody good luck! Sardines! The hedgehog said as he grabbed onto the can and started to drag it out. There were words written on the can. Um, yeah, um, um. Uh, Philip could never read human. The strange red, white, and black symbol was on the exterior of the can. After some careful maneuvering, Philip was able to pull the metal can onto his back. The contents inside didn't seem to be too heavy, which meant that greedy humans must have eaten some already. Still, even if there was one left, it would be a treat for his wife. She had not had for a long time. So the hedgehog set off with his prize and headed through the field of death and destruction. His speed was slower than before, and he needed to stop and rest occasionally, but however, it wasn't long until he reached the stream and was in the process of heading back to his home. He couldn't wait to show his wife what he had found, so he was sure that he had a talking to for being gone so long. The hours passed and the sun drifted lower until it fell below the horizon. As the evening twilight started to appear, Margaret saw her husband waywardly crossing the field. She was worried and waved while she was speaking. And where the bloody hell have you been, Philip? Philip approached, carrying a metal can on his back, but no flowers, laughing. Ah, oh, so... Now, where have you been, my dear husband? The female hedgehog put her paws on her sides and giggled while pointing. Boy, and what is that thing? 
Bill waddled past her, slid down into the small decline into their home, while his wife sighed and was glad that he was home and followed her husband inside. As the two critters stood by side, they looked at the sleeping brown rabbit, the female hedgehog sighed while she pointed. She came here after you left, Philip. Well, I gave her a few tar lips and let her rest. Uh, Philip yawned and slid the metal can along the dirt wall and then turned to face his wife. We can mess with this can tomorrow. His wife nodded and moved closer to rub her nose with his and as the light continued to dim, the two critters slept side by side, their quills tickling each other. With the occasional giggle from Margaret, that, that could be heard. Mm. Oh, Philip. Go to sleep. The dark burrow soon became very quiet, and a cool breeze blew in from the outside. It would be turning to winter soon, and the necessity to block the entrance would once again be in order. Well, that didn't need to be done at this time. It was still early fall. Now was the time to eat, be on one's fill, and store up enough fat to last the winter. That was the nature of the order of things. And both critters would be properly pudgy eventually, and, and be, nestle in for a long winter's rest. The hours passed. And soon the daylight appeared, and sounds of humans started to fill the air. Philip was the first to wake and hesitantly peeked his head out the entrance to his burrow. There were at least a dozen human men walking around dressed in green and brown uniforms with matching hats. They were armed with weapons and were walking past in two rows. Wiggling his nose, he ducked back inside to face his angry wife, although more worried than angry. Her eyes met his, and the two rubbed their nose while whispering. Philip, what, what's going on? The two rows of humans, they're dressed the same. They're probably looking for those dead humans I found yesterday. What? Dead humans? Philip, what did you do? The faithful husband relayed the details of his small adventure from the day before. The field of wreckage that lay upstream from their woods. The chamber with the humans that had passed away. And what had happened with the can. His trip back home was uneventful and until he was caught out by his, his female hedgehog with a, with a saucy mouth. She giggled. Oh, saucy mouth, huh? And more terms for you today, then. My dear husband. The male hedgehog laughed and looked at the oval-shaped can, pointing. I wonder what's inside that thing. I think it's sardines. Uh, those used to be everywhere, but I think the greedy humans ate them all. Meanwhile, the brown rabbit had woken up, though she was being very quiet, watching and listening to the banter of the two hedgehogs. The male hedgehog maneuvered around the burrow until he positioned the can in the center of the home. With each animal being able to see clearly, the hedgehogs both, Philip and Margaret, started to depod the can. There was a lid on top, and it didn't pull open like a normal sardine can. But after many tries, the top of the can started to slide off. There were ridges on each side of the can, and with considerable effort, the two of them were able to slide the lid off. Setting the, the top of the can to the free spot beside the rabbit, the trio of animals looked inside the now open can. There were stiff pieces of paper with something written on them, and the strange red, white, and black symbol was on each of the cards. 
Setting out the cards, Margaret started to sound out the words. Cyanide Dirt Codex Philip grumbled. All that work to bring back paper. Stupid humans, they all the sardines. Oh, look. A white circle. Oh, I bet it's candy. Inside, there were there was a white circle of uh, pressed dust. And before the hedgehog could say a word, the rabbit reached out and grabbed the white circle and then popped it into her mouth. Margaret shot her a look and drew across. No, you spit that out this instant. Philip nodded. I might be wrong. It might not be candy. P please, spit it out. But neither critter words were heeded. The rabbit dashed out of the bureau, out of the burrow, and out into the grassy area between the trees. Our side. Next time, bring me flowers. I I'll go out and find our rabbit friend. Uh, put those cards away, Philip, but keep them here. I like to practice my reading. It might come in useful one day. Her husband nodded and started to put the cards back into the tin. And they watched as his wife rear and whittled as she exited the home. Husbandly feelings started to emerge in the back of his mind, but were replaced when he heard his wife screaming. Philip, Philip, come quickly. The cards safely put away, he hurried through the narrow opening to the exit of his chamber and climbed up the hill. He could see Margaret crying and was pushing at the rabbit who was laying on the ground and not moving. It was not very long until the Philip reached the lifeless body of the rabbit as he sighed. It, it, it wasn't candy. The female hedgehog was crying and covered her eyes with her paws. <laughs> Philip, why did you have to say candy? That was a poison of some sort. The male hedgehog placed a paw on his wife's back and said, I'm sorry, Margaret. It, it does look like candy. I've seen similar pills that the humans carry, though. One pill I tried tasted sour and... I had to sleep a long time afterwards, so I guess some candy is just sleepy candy. Maybe that's all it is, he said with a hopeful tone. That flaving feeling of relief was soon dashed as he watched blood start to ooze out of the rabbit's mouth as she took her last breath. The two critters stood there mourning the loss of their rabbit neighbor. And Sally pleaded with whoever, whoever lived in the sky to... Keep all animals safe. Terrible sound filled the air and whined loudly over and over. It was rhythmic, with a long high pitch, then a low dull pitch, and back to high. Looking upwards, Philip saw more of the wrecked objects from the field falling in the sky. Grabbing his wife, hide now! The two critters quickly turned and started to run back to their underground home and slid quickly through the opening. Margaret watched in horror as the, uh, through the opening as object after object flew overhead, just barely uh, above the tops of the forest trees. The sound coming from the strange objects was terribly loud, 
Circles were spinning in front of the objects, but she could not see any more because her husband pulled her back inside. As soon as she was safely inside, Philip started to move rocks into place to seal the entrance. This time, the male hedgehog was listening to his instincts, and the decision to hide was the best course of action at this juncture. Once he had made his burrow as safe as he could, he sat down opposite of his wife and rubbed his nose with hers. Two mates were silent, feeling the ground shake as the human's terrible objects flew overhead. The distant, rhythmic sounds continued, till suddenly they ended. In time, the flying objects stopped, and the forest became eerily quiet. Neither hedgehog left their home and stayed buried deep within their burrow. Although... Since they did have some time on their hands, Philip puffed up his quills and gave his wife the look, and she giggled. Oh, Philip. This is the end of part one of the story. Pudgy hope you really liked the story. There will be five parts including this one. And Pudgy is working on part two now. If you like the story, can you please like the video? You don't have to, but Pudgy would appreciate it. Uh, please also subscribe to Pudgy so you don't miss out when Pudgy uploads chapter two. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye!